Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more to help you become a literary expert. So in today's video we are analysing another one of Hamlet's most iconic speeches and that is What a piece of work is a man from Act 2, Scene 2 of the play. This is a monologue and a monologue is a speech delivered by a character in the presence of other characters, unlike a soliloquy or an aside, which are speeches made out of other characters' earshot, so to speak. So the other characters are not meant to listen in on whatever the character is speaking at that point. So anyway, in this moment of the what a piece of work is a man speech, Hamlet is asking if Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, his friends, were sent by King Claudius, his uncle, and Queen Gertrude, his mum, to spy on him. So as Rosencrantz denies this, Hamlet shifts from a teasing, interrogative mode of questioning to a more emotional, philosophical temper, as he both marvels at and laments over man's contrasting capacity for nobility and baseness. And that is the most standard line of interpretation of the speech. However, I'd like to argue that there's an additional dimension to Hamlet's psychology in this moment, which is more inward focused. Just as much as he finds it difficult to reconcile man's dichotomous nature, so he also fears that he himself demonstrates this kind of dichotomy. So Hamlet here cannot stand the thought of him being both noble and foul. And so throughout the speech, and actually the play at large, one can argue, we see from his various linguistic, syntactical and rhythmic examples, his resistance to the idea that he could be just as contradictory and dichotomous as the man that he judges. So in the rest of this video, I'll be close reading this monologue to illustrate this line of argument. So join me and let's dive straight into it. Now, if you've already read the play, then you'll know that Hamlet is your poster procrastinator. He hesitates, delays, and can never bring himself to take decisive action. In fact, the entire play happens because Hamlet never takes the one action that he really wants to take, which is to avenge his father's death and kill his uncle. So Hamlet's tendency to delay is reflected in many of his most important speeches, including this one that we're analysing, What a Piece of Work as a Man. In this speech, we see Hamlet's delaying impulse come through on both a lexical and syntactical level. Specifically, we see it in the use of polysyllabic diction and periphrastic phrasing, periphrases. Now, while long sophisticated words are often seen in Hamlet's speeches, and ironically, he is the character who scorns verbosity with his words, words, words jibe. There seems to be a saturation of polysyllabic diction in this particular speech, such as disposition, which means temper, sterile promontory, bare cliff, overhanging firmament, the night sky above, majestical roof, the grand sky, pestilent congregation of vapours, rank smell, apprehension, this quintessence of dust, etc. Now note that the polysyllabic references tend to appear at points when Hamlet feels emotionally intense. For instance, when Hamlet laments that his melancholy disposition has made him see the earth as no more than a bleak cliff, a sterile promontory, and the environmental atmosphere around him as being infected with a foul and pestilent congregation of faith. By expressing raw emotions with hyper-intellectualized language, Hamlet dramatizes the polarizing pull between the forces of head and heart, as he struggles to control and make sense of a feeling, which is this overwhelming confusion about human nature, as if the more letters and words he can summon up, the better he can command his mind into rationalizing what is otherwise a deeply confusing and frustrating awareness about the state of man which is that men often behave in ways which cannot really be rationalised, veering from noble one moment to absolutely rank and base the next. By the way guys, if you find this video helpful so far, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below and subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss out on any of my top grade lit study content going forward. I'd also encourage you to check out my membership program by clicking the join button below if you want exclusive access to members only study content and make special video requests. 
I'll see you there. In this sense, then, we see that Hamlet's polysyllabic saturation in this moment may be a sort of coping mechanism, where he sees the seeming logicality of language as a shield to avoid dealing with the messiness of human nature. So to combat cognitive chaos, Hamlet compensates with lexical ceremony. This evasive impulse is also suggested in the long periphrastic sentence spanning eight and a half lines, all the way from I have of late to vapors. But the point he makes is really a simple one. He's saying, I've been feeling really upset recently, and as a result, everything around me looks like but he delays the arrival of this conclusion with layers upon layers of circumlocutory clauses describing the earth and the air in various guises before he lets drop that damning characterization of a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. So apart from revealing his impulse to deny confronting the truth, this labyrinthine sentence structure could also reflect Hamlet's jumbled state of mind as he struggles to grapple with man's complexity. Now we know that a recurring source of agony for Hamlet is being at peace with cognitive dissonance, as he struggles to accept that people and society often exhibit contradictory traits, and sometimes bafflingly so. In fact, shortly before this what a piece of work is a man speech, Hamlet has already himself acknowledged, at least on an intellectual level, if not emotional level, that there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. There's always room then to view the same person, behavior, or phenomenon in different and even polarizing ways. For instance, the earth can be a goodly frame, but it can also seem like a sterile promontory. The air, the atmosphere, can be a brave overhanging firmament, a majestical roof fretted with golden fire, but to the embittered soul, it can come across as no more than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. And most of all, man can be a piece of work, at once noble in reason and infinite in faculty. And yet, he is also a quintessence of dust. So perspective depending, the earth is a safe house, but also a bleak, risky cliff. The environment around us is a magnificent container, but also a pollutant absorber. And the human being is a glorious, complex and incredible creation, but just as much a mere speck of passing existence in the grand scheme of time. And while Hamlet registers the dichotomy of it all, he struggles to come to terms with it emotionally, as we see from his histrionic, sarcastic exclamations. What a piece of work is a man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action how like an angel, in apprehension how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me, no, nor woman neither. Now notice that in Hamlet's awareness of man's contradictory nature, a sense of emotional and cognitive conflict is created in his mind, which is suggested by the use of anastrophe in the sequence in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. Anastrophe is a syntactical device referring to the inversion of natural word order. So instead of the usual subject-verb-object construction, SVO construction, the parts of speech are reversed or shuffled, with the parts that are rearranged to fall as stressed syllables in the line usually taking on more thematic significance. So instead of how express and admirable man is in form and moving, it reads in form and moving how express and admirable. So this reversal of natural word order could signal a mind in conflict and turmoil, as if Hamlet feels that his initial, natural, and presumably more naive understanding of man has now been flipped on its head with a suspicion of Claudius' murder of his father, Gertrude's quick remarriage to Claudius, and his friends Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's espionage and betrayal against him. So his final statement, man delights not me, no, nor women neither, is likewise an example of anastrophic syntax. To start the line with man delights, 
only to follow it with a sequence of negatives, not me, no, nor neither, reinforces his impression of disappointment and disillusionment, as Hamlet begins to come to terms with the realisation that people don't always behave in logical or palatable ways that align with his moral understanding and worldview. And that's it for my analysis of Hamlet's What a Piece of Work is a Man speech from Act 2, Scene 2 of the play, everyone. I hope you found my insights useful and refreshing and that they've inspired you to look at Hamlet and the play's key themes in a new and deeper way. Feel free to comment below if you have any questions or just want to share your own point of view about the speech. As always, I love to hear what you guys have to say. For your next video, I recommend that you watch my analysis on Hamlet's Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt soliloquy from Act 1, Scene 2, which is a super important moment for an understanding of Hamlet's relationship with his mother, Gertrude, and is also really revealing about the tragic hero's emotional and moral prejudices. And you can check that out right here. Click the join button below to be part of my membership program if you want personalized essay feedback, make exclusive video requests, and access members-only content. Please hit the thumbs up button below if you found this video useful, so I'll be encouraged to keep making these weekly study videos for you and other passionate lit learners all around the world. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss out on my weekly content, and I will see you in the next one. Ciao!